Welcome everybody. The weekly Q and A. Weekly Q and A. <laughs> I hope you guys are happy on this Monday. And uh, we got some cool stuff for you guys. Um, just you know, I'm do I'm doing a little workshop tomorrow. I believe there is one spot left, and it is for the section of the group that is more like beginners trying to get started, trying to get your first client or your second client or at the very start of your journey. Yeah, we're going to go over a couple of things. This workshop is free, but I don't want to have like a gazillion people on it because it's going to be interactive. So if we have 100 people or 200 people, it's just too much. Um, so this is something that I'm going to sell as a paid training later. So if you're interested, I believe there's one spot left. So shoot me a message if you want that. So otherwise, let's get into the good stuff. Kevin asks, Curious what niches do you think are dominating during the global pandemic? Which niches will die off? Um, you know, obviously this is by no means an expansive list, Kevin. I don't have uh, everybody, but I'll tell you the work from home is crushing it right now. Anybody who's selling work from home is doing really, really well. Um, anybody who is doing um, uh, like weight loss from home and health, What's up? All right, brother. Well, it's, I'll send you some details after this and we can uh, we can chat about it as well. Um, another one that's working really well in this is divorce. A lot of people are stuck at home and getting divorced. Um, ones that are doing really, really well are mostly like travel and tourism related. Hotels, restaurants probably are the two hardest hit. Um, but there's always ways around that, right? Like I was uh, almost uh, when this whole thing started back in March, my we were walking through a construction zone and my daughter almost got run over by a speeding car. And I remember my first thought was like, what a fucking asshole, like slow down. There's kids, it's construction zone. And then when I saw the car go by, it said Liefer Rondo. And the, the German word for delivery is Liefern. So it's like the delivery guy who's running around delivering food. So those people who've adapted with like takeout and things like that are actually doing really, really well. So I don't want you to get caught up in the idea, Kevin, that certain niches do well. And certain niches don't don't because like yeah there's probably niches doing better than others but in every niche you'll find a hundred million dollar roofer and you'll find a guy who is struggling to get a phone call right so like within every niche there's always a range so you um you'll do a lot better if you focus on the clients that are already having traction and helping them multiply it rahat how should we approach a child care in Miami, US? What audience targeting should we use? How many ad sets? How many should we test initially? How much budget? Um, here's the thing with that. Um, obviously the, the budget is, is, I would say, like if you're running cold ads, almost inevitably, if you're not starting with something that's working, you're gonna lose money before you make it. Like nobody tells you when you run cold ads, you're gonna lose money, but you will lose money before you will make it. So start with a budget that you're okay with, like in, in many cases, like knowing you're not gonna get it back, but what you're gonna get is data information. Now, as far as how much to test, there's this idea that you got split test and split test. Now I actually am running a campaign for a client right now and we're getting leads for $2 a piece. And it's almost hard to lose when you're getting like, and these are webinar registrations for like $2 a piece. And I don't do a lot of these kind of campaigns for clients anymore, but I am in this case. And it's really, really interesting because we're only testing one ad, one targeting, one image, one piece of copy. Um, so the idea that you got to do like a gazillion split test, um, the split tests are more for helping you diagnose where your problems. There's four things in general that you want to split test, like don't major in the minors. So your targeting is one of those. If you're doing Facebook, your image is one of those, um, your headline and your offer itself, and then the message. Those are the four things that I would always test, but you know, you can get away with running an ad to cold traffic and having it convert first ad, first time right away. And a lot of how that, that works, why we're able to successfully get like $2 leads right out of the gate is not because like I'm such a, a brilliant ad writer it's because I've done my research on the market that I'm advertising to before I ever ran a single ad. So I knew all their pain points. I knew what was in their head. I knew all the things they had tried. So if you do that, you, you can get away with testing a lot less. And if you're interested, by the way, I've got a document that uh, will cover all the targeting options. So I can send you a link to that if you'd uh, like to check it out. 
Tyler, are you using SMS marketing or text messages in your agency? Yes. I wouldn't say we're doing a ton, but one of the things that I've learned from doing this, and this will happen to any of you, is that after you get a client, and it doesn't matter which kind of client, there's a period where there's like an initial period of excitement, like, yeah, let's go do it. And then there's what I call the, the mid lull, where you don't talk to each other. And most clients have had bad experiences where in that mid lull, like things don't get done and balls get dropped. And they will almost always project that onto you. And so what I've learned is that clients think you're doing nothing if you don't let them know. And so we've got a couple of text sequences we use and they're little just simple things that hey, that just say, they don't say anything specific, but they're, they're automated follow-ups that go out and say, hey, I'm really excited about the progress we're making on blank. Uh, can't wait to see what it's doing. But those little preemptive proactive communications let clients know that you're actually working at their thing. And so instead of them, you, cause what happens if they don't hear from you, usually what it means in, in reality is that you're actually in their ad manager, working on their campaigns and all that. But what they assume is that you're doing nothing and that you've taken their money and disappeared. So having a, a couple of proactive text messages can go a long, long way. Um, Sahil, yes, I've been doing that for clients too. Instead of multiple AB tests, I just see what worked in the past and run lead gen ads single, uh, image and copy. Sahil, you get a giant thumbs up for me because yeah, like too many people say you got to split test. And what, what happens is, especially on a low budget, you end up just like split testing, like a gazillion really poor ads. And I would rather put all my money on one great ad that might take me half a day to set up than to, that more for the research than, than to try a, a gazillion different things. Geraldine, any agency owners feeling overwhelmed with their client load? Um, sorry, let me start that over. Any agency owners feeling overwhelmed with their client load that things are slipping through the cracks? Geraldine, this is something nobody really talks about, but every time your agency triples in size, so like when you go from just you to like three employees, when you go from like three employees to like 10, when you go from like 10 to 30, I've never been personally, I never liked an agency more than like 30 people. So that's kind of like my max. Um, but it, it, same thing happens if you go from like 30 to 90 or hundred in that range, every single time you triple in size, your machine will break and your systems and processes that, um, worked at a lower level will stop. And so this happens all the time is when you break the machine, the quality slips and all these stuff start following, falling through the cracks. It's, it's actually really normal. So that's the first thing I would tell you. It, it happens to everybody in every service business, not just agencies, by the way. This happens to your clients as well when they grow. Um, the short answer to, to how to solve that is have really good systems and processes. You want to like document what's in your head and get it on paper so that your employees and your staff can execute things the way you want them done. Um, but without you having to do everything personally, because that'll make a, like a huge, huge difference. Um, because you'll get your way done without, so it's like, it's checklist, really. It's, if you boil it down to one thing, it's checklist to get things done correctly. Uh, Daniel, silly questions, but how do you guys end an email when sending a proposal? Should I try looking forward to hearing from you? Let me know what you think. Let me know if you have any questions. Daniel, I'm going to give you a counterintuitive answer, which is say, stop fucking using proposals. And I'm not saying this is 100% your experience. There are some exceptions, by the way. Really big, like, government contracts or really big, like, uh, I have a friend who's doing, like, a multi-million dollar pharmaceutical SEO deal right now. And they have a proposal process, and you're going to have to go through it. And they vet you, and you have to submit all these things. That's, like, just their process, and you're not going to be able to avoid that. But for 99% of clients, especially you guys are mostly just dealing with like brick and mortar or e-commerce or online service and consultants. If they're asking for a proposal, then something before that stage is broken. Because what usually happens when you send a proposal is you work really hard, you customize it, you try and get everything perfect, and then you send it away, and then the client doesn't even fucking read it. And actually behind the scenes, they usually get like three or four proposals from your competitors, and they don't read theirs either. And um, what ends up happening is you spend the next week, two weeks, three weeks trying to figure out just how to get them to read it. And you're trying to like friendly nudge them going, uh, have you read my proposal yet? Giving them the little elbow in the side. And the reality is um, your proposal means that something beforehand about your offer is off. And so it's going to put you in a chasing stage. And I would tell you, don't chase clients. Make your offer better because then you won't have to chase them. So more than likely it means 
if if because if they're shopping you on price which a proposal usually means they are it means they're putting you in a box in a category and there's ways to take you out of that category and they can be just little things so like i mentioned kyle the other week who's converting cold traffic for like uh into 5k per month clients and you don't really need a lot of those to move the needle um but a big part of how he's doing his main package is seo right so he's selling a lot of seo but he also offers other things with it so he helps them get covered in uh formal news media. He helps them with their referrals. He helps them with the phone training. And those are just little add-ons that take him out of that box called I do SEO and put him in a new category where he's the only one who offers a holistic, complete solution in his case. So you got to get out of that box and then don't make proposals because proposals are just going to put you in chase mode and they very rarely turn into actual business. I'm not saying never. I have had clients who come back from proposals. But for every 10 proposals you're going to make, you're going to get like one, two clients. Much better is to, to ask them, like, what your what is your real objections to say, hey, you won't hurt my feelings. Like, it seems like you're not completely sold on this. Uh, what is it? Because then you, you can get the truth and actually deal with the real objection. And you can use that feedback to improve your offer. Um, Jeremy, so I lost my job, started a content marketing agency, set up ads. People get to my store, but bounce any advice. Uh, Jared, Jeremy, first of all, congratulations on starting. I started in a recession too in 2008 uh, or 2007, and uh, it sucks, but it's 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 uh, when you learn how to make it work in a recession, you can make it work in anything. If people are going to your store and bouncing, I'm assuming you're de doing e-commerce. Um, chances are your product's not that exciting. The big, the single biggest thing that makes a difference in e-commerce is the product. And I'll give you a little shortcut. I don't do a ton with e-commerce personally, but I have a lot of really successful friends who do. And what they do primarily is they'll test five to 10 products per day. So what they'll do is they go to Amazon and they find what's already a bestseller. They don't ever guess. They're always looking for what's proven to sell, what's proven to work. And then they'll go to like AliExpress or, or some kind of other equivalent supplier and see what they can get that almost exactly matches that bestseller. And then they'll try five to 10 products every day religiously with little tiny ads. And they might only have like every 30, 40th product be a real winner, but when they do, it really takes off. And I've, I've got some friends on the highest side doing $300,000 a day in e-commerce. Um, so that's how high it can go. And, you know, I got a lot more friends in the like five, 10 K per day kind of range. And obviously those aren't profit margins. You know, that's why a big reason why I don't do e-commerce because that can be a little misleading a uh, $10,000 day. You might only make 500 bucks. Um, but anyway, you know, that's how they're doing really, really big numbers. And so much of that is the product success. So don't think like you're just going to put up one product and people are going to buy it. You're going to have to like try a lot of things. And that's just normal. Like throw a lot of spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks. Um, David, this is just a comment, not a question. But when you realize you're not in the lead gen business, but in the teaching your clients how to sell business. Um, so, so true. You know, I actually first... Uh, experiences if, if you work with brick and mortar they'll say things like if it's a client we want or a customer we want nine out of ten times we sell them no problem and that's never true by the way never even close to true it it'd be lucky if it was like 30 percent but they'll they believe it and uh, one of the things that really helped me and i wrote about this in the book is when you know that's not true and you know they're full of shit you got to call them on it in a nice way before you get into it so one of the things i did is i actually mystery shop. So I remember I had a, a lawyer who said that exact phrase, you know, if, if client calls 95% of the time we close them nine out of 10 times. So I knew that wasn't true because it's never true. Um, so what I did is I called their law firm and I said, Hey, I hurt my back in an accident and just made up a bogus story. And I recorded the call. And what ended up happening is they screwed it up. And then I sent him the recording and said, do you still think they closed that your staff closes nine out of 10 uh, that they want. And then of course they, they don't answer the phone. So one thing that I, somebody I think is a real genius at that uh, this has done is they set up automated notifications to their client, especially when they don't answer the phone. Like that's one of the big problems with brick and mortar is you generate business for them and they don't even answer it. Or you generate an email lead and they take fucking forever to get back to it. Is he has it send a notification to the owner that said, the notification says someone called trying to give you money and you guys didn't answer or someone called or email trying to give you money and you've taken this long to get back to them. So I don't know how to set up those automated things personally. Somebody more tech savvy than me could probably tell you how to do that. But yes, you are in the teaching your 
the clients how to actually sell. If, if all they needed was more traffic, this would be the easiest business in the world. Uh, but 90% of the time it's traffic is not their problem. They just think it is. Um, so yeah, so find ways that you can help them sell. And one of the things that I do is I look for who are the easiest people to convert. So like an example of that, I had a, a law firm that I was working with and one of the guys was, he has a really big SEO agency and owns a law firm. So they're doing like a million a month combined across the two. So he's doing like 12 million a year. It's a very large business with two businesses. And um, one of the things he was doing is on their things is they have a, a team of 40 people who answer the phones all day long. And they have a rule that if somebody submits an email contact, that you have less than three minutes to get back to them or it's considered a dead lead. You basically, you gotta strike while the iron's hot. And he was telling me he sent a lead to his dad who's like a 70 year old lawyer or 65 year old lawyer who's on the verge of retirement and has only ever had to deal with referrals his whole life. And his dad got a Google lead on a Friday and decided to call them back Monday afternoon. So like Friday afternoon, whole day passed to Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Um, you know, you know, personally, if you're searching on Google and somebody doesn't get back to you, you're not waiting three days for an answer, right? So what ended up happening is no surprise, they lost the deal. And, um, but there's a, there's a hidden psychology in there, which says, you know, this lawyer was used to dealing with referrals is, is referrals will wait three days. They're not shopping around like a Google lead. So one of the things that I like to do for clients that you can work into your agency is look for where, what's the low hanging fruit. What's the easy business you can bring them that they almost can't screw up referrals being one of those. So if you got a couple of strategies to generate a referral, or to get a past client back in the door, they can, it gives them more leeway to screw up the selling than uh, like, you know, a referral, you can make a lot of mistakes and they'll still deal with you as we're like a Google lead. Uh, they're gonna screw that up really quickly. So that's just a pro tip, but yes, you are in the helping your clients get better at learning to sell. So Efren says, why is starting up a client's business manager account so fucking complicated? <laughs> Uh, all I can say, Efren, I feel you, and I have a love-hatred relationship with Facebook ads. I'm on my sixth Facebook ad account. I've spent a lot of money with them uh, over the years, uh, and not just my own, but like client money, and it's been really good to us, and we've made a lot of money with it, but man, is their customer support terrible, and the, the tech overly complicated, and there's, there's definitely some things to be improved upon, so I feel you. Um, it's definitely one of the hardest things is when you go in and clients really excited and then you're running Facebook ads for them and then it takes like a week of back and forth to get everything set up and to get them to in, you know, you lose some of that momentum. So I would suggest start with something other than Facebook ads, but there's, that's just Facebook ads. Business manager is complicated. Suzanne, what are all the ways to get your business ranking on the first page without starting a Google My Business account? Uh, Suzanne, I, I assume you're you're speaking for local since you're talking about my business uh, listing. The short answer, and this is going to be like pretty generic because you didn't give specifics, but is good backlinks. And I'll tell you um, a couple of things that always worked really well for me is is Google tends to complicate this by telling you a bunch of bullshit. They what Google tells you to do is like just make quality content and people will link to you. So the first thing I would say is like, you have to actually deserve a number one ranking. Like you're in this day and age, you know, we would call that on site. But like, if you look at you and your competitors, is the actual website better? The actual page you're promoting? If you don't have that, you're going to be fighting a never ending uphill battle. But the second thing is when it comes to the off page and building links, the biggest thing you can do is just reverse engineer why number one sites are number one. So what I would do is I would go into, you know, either Majestic SEO or, um, Ahrefs or um, Open Site Explorer, and I would pull number one sites that are in my niche. They wouldn't necessarily be in my city, and I would look at the backlinks that they're actually getting. What's like actually causing them to be number one? And then I would just go and see if I could get a link from those places. That's the fastest way I found to hack S SEO. See what Google is doing and copy it. Um, that you know that'll save you a whole bunch of time and headaches if you do that. Gustavo. Hello everyone, one of my clients got banned this morning from Facebook business and later this day received a direct deposit of 4,250 uh, euros through PayPal from Facebook ads. Any suggestion about this problem on how this happened? Uh, Gustavo, it sucks. Um, Facebook does bill you after the fact. So and sometimes as much as like 
15 to 30 days later. So I actually just had a client get a, a banned ad account and we got billed like 15 days later. And because the account was banned, we couldn't print our last invoice. It was this giant headache. Uh, so it does happen. Um, what I'm going to tell you is though, as a whole, don't make your business so 100% dependent on Facebook ads, like have like two or three tools in the toolbox. I know it's like, you know, if you get really good at Facebook ads, it can be a big laser focus. But if you want a real business that's like still going to be around in 10 years, you need at least five independent ways to generate business. And you need at least five independent ways to be able to, to help a client. So uh, don't be 100% dependent on Facebook ads. Having said that, you can just make a new account with a new credit card. Um, I don't know. I've done it lots of times now. Don't don't think you're ever going to get your account back. back. Yeah, I have had it happen to me one time. But in general, they're just going to send you a copy and paste message. And uh, that's it. You'll, you're not going to get it back. So I'm not rooting against you. Um, last question I have here. Nick. Does anyone have proven Facebook lead ads to generate digital marketing services? Anything under 10 bucks a lead looking to buy proven ads in the space? Nick, this is a generally a good idea, by the way. I see a lot of beginners stuck um, or, you know, people who are maybe a little more intermediate where they think the thing stopping them is, is getting a client. But actually the thing stopping them is not knowing what they would do to actually help that client. So they don't have that confidence when they show up to just be like, yes, I can help you. Because if you know what you're going to do for a client, your offer naturally comes out of that. It's, it's when you send like these generic, I'll generate more business for you. And it's kind of unspecific. Now, having said that, one thing I would, a um, little backwards in your thinking, at least in my opinion, Nick, is uh, you don't want to just go after cheapest leads. You want to be the one who can spend the most amount of money in your space. And that's the longest, most sustainable long-term way. And so that involves like working your back end and getting good at sales two, three, and four. So like, let's say you're working with a dentist and he signs somebody for some x-rays. What happens after that? Whether they can upsell those people into bigger procedures and more things and invite their friends and family determines how much money you're going to be able to spend on the front end. Because let's just say there's two dentists. One dentist, he gets an x-ray person, and then you go and generate another x-ray person for him, and you go and generate another x-ray. Um, and he, say he makes a couple hundred bucks off those person. Now let's imagine there's a second dentist who does that, but then also every 10th person he sells a cosmetic procedure for 35,000. And of those 10 people, he gets four of them to refer. Well, who's gonna have more money to spend on ads? Right, so a lot of times we don't realize the back end and the front end are, are related and connected. So I would work with beginning lawyers, and they would say to me, you know, these attorneys would say, "Oh, I can't spend that much money." Like, you know, they would name the really big shot lawyer. He spends like hundreds of thousands of dollars every month. And in the beginning, I was always like, "Yeah, like that's a lot of money." And then I got to consult with those really big lawyers, and I saw they did things differently. And they always would continue marketing to people to, to in order to generate. Um, repeat business and referrals, even after they had long stopped being a client. So if you became a client once, they, they continued marketing to you for 20, 30, 40 years. They never stopped. It was, they had a motto, buy, die, or unsubscribe. So either you're going to come back and be a client, you're going to die and, you know, a natural part of life and you're not going to be part of it, or you're going to unsubscribe. But that was the attitude that they, they had with it. But because they, if a person came in the door with a $6,000 piece of business and then referred them $25,000 of business, it gave them more to spend on the front end than everybody else. So they could basically eliminate their competitors by doing that. So um, I'm all for generating a cheap leads. We actually just did a deal where we bought uh, some working intellectual property for motorcycle cases. I'm like, I don't want to figure this out. So they, they sent me their targeting, their emails, and landing pages, uh, and I got it super, super cheap, which is kind of amazing. So I know I'm going to be able to get cheap leads, but having said that, I want to be able to outspend everybody else. So you're, you're on to a really great idea. I don't want to like tell you you're not doing a great idea. That is a great idea. Just be careful that you don't get caught in the idea that what you need to be successful is a cheap front end. You need to be able to spend more money than everybody else. And the way to do that is have a better back end. So I hope that makes sense. Um, so that's all the questions we got for this week. Just a little reminder that if you guys are interested in checking out that, uh, the workshop I get, it. this is for the, the kind of beginning people in this group. We're going to go get you your first client. I'm only taking so many people, even though it's free because it's a workshop, it's going to be interactive. And so too many people, it just doesn't really work. Uh, we'll break the Zoom. So if you're interested in that, I will post 
um, a little bit of details below this. But other than that, I hope you guys uh, got some real value out of these questions here. Uh, sometimes just, you know, the best stuff you see is not what you're dealing with, but as somebody who's maybe two, three, four steps ahead of you or in a similar situation, they ask a question you wouldn't otherwise think about. So there's a lot of value in listening to other people's uh, Q&A. So anywho, that's all I got for you guys this week. I will, uh, I'll post the replay, by the way, on YouTube if you'd like to be part of the channel. So um, peace out, guys.